thank you. Good, good, uh, good morning, because it's uh, noon now in, in Champagne. So good morning to the UK and to everyone here. Uh, I'm very, very uh, honored to be invited to this Zoom uh, thing. I'm not so good at Zoom things, so at those, at those uh, I prefer contact. Uh, because it's the way we are. Maybe this is our French culture in a way. But we, I will try to do our best and talk about the subjects that are really important at We Rodre or what we uh, are doing and what um, uh, is our philosophy. Uh, I think more, it's more a question of philosophy, our vision, and it all comes back to the vision of the founder uh, because we are here uh, after seven generations of family-owned company uh, with a clear vision from the founder which really um, made what we are today. Uh, the vision was, uh, of course, that terroir of Champagne was very important. Uh, it's not just a question of wine, of celebration. It's a question of terroir because, as you know, we have many, many soils, many different soils in Champagne. Not just chalk. Many people believe we just have chalk, but no, it's not true. We have chalk, but we have clay, we have sand. We have a lot of different soils in Champagne, lots of different exposures. And um, those uh, choices made by the founder were to really focus on special terroir, special soils, uh, special what we call villages, but it's more than villages. It's uh, mid-slope, lieu locations, plots sometimes that have a very, very specific uh, expression. And um, the family or the founder was really impressed by the finesse and the elegance that chalk could bring to, to Champagne wines. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, I think it is what uh, is the most important decision made by the family over the years. It was to, to focus on those soils, to make um, very specific and unique wines uh, of elegance, of ripeness as well, because chalk has is a fantastic soil which, which can at the same time uh, allow uh, low yielding. So low yielding means more ripeness, more uh, uh, fruit and flavors, and at the same time, it's very low pH, which means uh, high acidity, and which is uh, uh, the balance of these two elements of high acidity or low pH and uh, good ripeness makes wines with, with a lot of balance. And this is what you can find all over the other wines, from Cristal to um, even to Brut Premier, uh, which is slightly, slightly different uh, of the other wines. So the family vision was to make, to acquire special terroir, to make wine of finesse, of elegance, uh, wine of identity, um, with this terroir expression, and, and all the winemaking was meant to really preserve this terroir, this terroir expression until the last moment or the consumption of wine. And this is really what, what, what is um, our, um, our main con uh, strategy or philosophy. So first, Pinot Noir because um, at that time in the 17, late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, we had Pinot Noir in Champagne and we had white varieties. Chardonnay didn't exist back then yet. It was a blend of Pinot Blanc, of Chardonnay and so on. But the white grapes in Champagne were really made to soften the strengths of Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir was the key to uh, the blends in Champagne back then. And it was a uh, the passion of the Rodreur family. That's why most of our terroir, the first purchase of our terroir, were Pinot Noir terroir, uh, buying, of course, Montagne de Reims in Verzenay, Verzy, uh, in Beaumont-sur-Velle in 1840s, 
roughly, that was the, the purchase time. And then uh, buying AI, uh, of course, Pinot Noir from AI and uh, Cumière and Mareuil sur AI, all the area of south facing area of Champagne. That was really the first move of the family. They were fascinated with Pinot Noir and trying to, to get the best, the best flavor. Um, today, I will say that our vintage wine, uh, Brut Vintage, is maybe the uh, con con concentrates this vision. I always say this is our vision wine, the vision, the, the original vision of the house. And when you drink our vintage wine, which is based on Verzi, uh, about 70, 80% Pinot Noir from Verzi, and always a little bit of Chardonnay from Chouy, I think it embodies really what is, what is Rodreur, what is uh, the, the original vision of uh, Louis Rodreur and, uh, and uh, the first and second generation of the family. Then came um, the Cumière area. Um, which is other Pinot Noir, Cumière en Aï, uh, often made on a rosé, by the way, because it was south facing and very uh, ripe area. So, by, just by the level of ripeness, the uh, pressing was extremely hard to make and the juice were pink uh, because of the ripeness of the skin and the south facing of this vineyard. And that's what we used to call Oeil de Perdri, you know, the Partridge's Eye uh, wine, which, um, which uh, was uh, a typical wine. The rosé comes a long way in Champagne, in fact, back a long way in Champagne. And when I look at the book of 1832 of the house, we were making those two wines. We were making a rosé, Oeil de Perdri, from Cumière and Aï. And we were making a vintage, which was uh, Verzi Verzonnet, coming from the Sillery Grand Mousseux area. So this is uh, cooler, more expressive, uh, more uh, structured kind of, of, of terroir. So this, this is what, uh, what the family has been building. And then the third generation came in and Crystal was created, as you know, in 1876. At the same time, purchasing vineyards in Côte des Blancs, uh, in Avis, in Benil sur Roger, uh, buying some more vineyards in Aï also, um, and in uh, Chouy and so on. So there was this, this is the era of Cristal, which is 1876, uh, with the idea to combine a little bit more Chardonnay uh, and play a little even more on chalk more elegant and that was all the idea of Cristal and long time later Cristal Rosé to concentrate on these soils um, which were um, which were um, even more chalky and uh, with a little bit more Chardonnay maybe than the original uh, wines we were making so that was the 1876-1880 I Chardonnay is known in Champagne for the first time in 1880. So that's exactly that moment where we identify Chardonnay and we give a name to Chardonnay. This is not just Pinot Blanc, Petit Mélier, Arban, a blend of white grapes. It's Chardonnay. So you can see in this 1870s, the, era, the, uh, the development of Chardonnay and Côte des Blancs. Uh, Chardonnay being not anymore a second quality grape or just a grape to a blending gra grape to you be used on hot years because the Pinot is so strong that you need Chardonnay to lighten a little bit. That was really the idea at the beginning. But understanding that Chardonnay could be uh, itself uh, uh, maybe uh, not a second role, but a first role in the game. Uh, reintroducing Chardonnay in the game of blending. So this is the third generation of Louis Rodreur, Léon Olry Rodreur. And if you see on a bottle of Cristal, maybe some people are surprised when they see a bottle of Cristal, they see L-O-R. There are three names, three letters. L-O-R, which is Léon Olry Rodreur. 
So uh, this is not Louis Rodreur, this is Leon Henri Rodreur, third generation, who put his name on this wine because he has, he has a vision of this elegant, chalky wine. Um, and then times where, uh, times has moved and Brut Premier was created uh, in the early 1900s as a bigger picture of Champagne, purchasing a little bit of grapes because the yields were very low. Uh, by the way, this is the only wine of the house that has a uh, purchased grapes. All the other wines, vintage wines, are estate bottled, so they come from our own vineyards. And uh, so the Brut Premier was created with a finesse also. And very important Brut Premier because it allows to uh, maintain crystal and the vintage at the higher possible level. When, when the year is not so beautiful in Champagne, when the ripeness is not achieved, uh, Brut Premier playing with reserve wines, so older vintages and so on, is uh, makes possible to maintain a style and maintain the other wines in difficult years. Uh, that was really the game of Brut Premier. And oh, how difficult were the years in the 19, beginning of 1900s with a phylloxera hitting the vineyards in 1890. So a lot of vineyards were destroyed by phylloxera. Then uh, the First World War destroyed 40% of the vineyards, um, so very, very lot of destructions and lots of, of difficulties at that time, and Brut Premier was a result of this difficult time. That's why, that's why I always say that we are resilient people in Champagne, because with such difficulties, we were able to create something that would make it possible over the difficult time, and Brut Premier is our, I should call it our war wine. It's really our difficult time wine. Um, and then, uh, more recently, you have Cristal Rosé that was created in 1976. This is a decision of the sixth generation, Jean-Claude Rousseau, who decided to um, extract four beautiful plots of Cristal Estate, which were always riper, uh, richer, and more burgundian in their expression. And uh, he decided to, to make a rosé version of Cristal. So this is four plots that used to make Cristal before 1976, and that were in 1974, excuse me, and, and were reintroduced into, um, into Cristal Rosé and are farmed since 1974 to make Cristal Rosé. More recently, there is a Brut Nature. So that's another, that's more the seventh generation. So this is Frédéric Rousseau, uh, the current uh, CEO of the company and family member, seventh generation, a descendant of the family, who um, wanted to create a zero dosage wine, a wine with uh, less sugar, or no sugar, in fact. And um, so that's what we made with 06 Brut Nature. 2006, created in 2006, uh, Brut Nature from the Cumier area. So we wanted not to play on the chalky side, but on the clay side. So this is a very clay area to make a larger, fruitier um, type of wine that we make only when we have perfect grapes, because being a zero dosage, you need to be very, very, uh, you need to have perfect grapes of ripeness and healthiness. And as you know, in Champagne, if you are late picking on a cool year, you can have botrytis in the game. And botrytis is not good for zero dosage wine. So we only make this wine when we have no botrytis. Very clean, ripe year with lo lots of fruit. And we can, we can, we can uh, make this wine. And in 2012, we made the crystal the Brut Nature, excuse me, Brut Nature Rosé, which is the last baby from the same, from the same vineyards of Cumière with uh, a cool soaking of um, Pinot Noir to give a little bit more color, to come back to this idea of Eu de Perdri, in fact, 
um, because it came from this, it started there. So it's like a circle. We are going back where it started. And this is a way for us to dig deeply in our, in our roots. So we have 242 hectares today, 242 hectares. All our vintage come from our, our uh, vineyards. And, um, and what we have done also is to maybe refocus, maybe to come back to the, I, I said it at the beginning, the original vision of each generation is very important to us. And what I did myself when I joined Roderer 30 years ago, 31 years ago, I studied, uh, I spent a lot of time studying the archives, understanding what uh, each generation wanted to do or wanted to create. And I'm trying so slowly, softly over the last 20 years to come back to this original vision for each wine. I think each wine is here because it represents a decision taken by the family at one moment for one terroir. And um, it's important to stick to this, not to go back and say, uh, we maintain only what the vision is, but to maintain where we come from. It's important for us. And for, when you speak terroir, it's important for us to, to know where we come from and what we, uh, what was the vision, what we have done slowly, year after year, generation after year, to really, really uh, move on this, uh, in, in, in what we are, we are making today. It comes back to maybe to the second chapter, which is sustainability. Uh, and this is also one of the reasons. Um, having done all this study of what we used to do, it came, uh, as a, uh, an obvious decision to initiate in the late 90s, early 2000 or late 90s, to initiate a, a conversion, a transition back to, um, let's call it organic uh, farming. I put it in a different way, which I call, I call it regenerative farming, uh, because all the idea was to regenerate. We have destroyed over the 60s, 70s with herbicides and pesticides. We have destroyed a lot of biodiversity. We have destroyed um, in the soil, the magic of soil, the magic of mushrooms, bacteria, uh, weeds, uh, insects, all those things working together to create terroir, soil. Uh, and uh, maybe be using herbicide and pesticides, we have stopped this process of complexity. So we wanted to reintroduce this uh, by regenerating our soils. Uh, same for, for the vineyards. We realized that we were using clones a uh, few clones of Pinot Noir, around five, six clones were used, or no more. Uh, Chardonnay was even less clones, it was four clones. Um, so the, compared to the massal selection, the historic massal selection that was uh, hundreds of individuals, uh, it made sense for us to restart the massal selection, to regenerate one more time, our, um, our uh, diversity. Same for the pruning and all the techniques we are using in the vineyards. We redesigned our grafting to be very, very, to have very little impact on the vines, uh, less wounds, and we redesigned our pruning techniques also to decrease the number of, wood, of wounds created by the pruning uh, itself to maintain um, the healthiness uh, of the vines. Maybe you know that, but many um, wood disease are appearing since the 70s, 80s, 90s in the vineyards. 
on the grafting point or somewhere in the vines. And some people must pull out a vine that is 20, 25 years old. You know, it's still a young vine, but it's, it's, it's really tired uh, being only 25 years old, which was not happening before. So we had also to regenerate our vines and our techniques to maintain this full healthiness of, of the vines. So all that together, if you put the pruning, if you put the grafting, if you add the nasal selection, if you add the soil, the organic farming and so on, in fact, it's all about regenerating our ecosystem and um, making it stronger, more resilient and uh, more original as well, more uh, with a greater identity. So all this move to um, sustainability. So we, we chose the organic direction. So st we stopped herbicides and we stopped synthetic pesticide. Uh, that was our decision to go very, very uh, in this organic direction. Uh, we used, of, we were influenced also by permaculture. Uh, I, I'm lucky enough to have met in the uh, early 90s Bill Mollison, who was uh, the, who invented permaculture in, in Australia, uh, and uh, I think it was a fascinating uh, cre creation or invention. Uh, coming back to one more time, the more uh, respectful way of, of farming. Uh, we have been influenced as well by biodynamic farming. Um, we, we are not biodynamic certified except on 10 hectares, but we use some of the biodynamic. We have tried all the biodynamic tools, preparations and so on. And we have made control in the vineyards, uh, organic biodynamic. And each time we have found that bio, over many vintages, and it's not a decision just for one vintage, but over many vintages, when we have seen uh, um, a, a, re a real effect on soil or vineyards of a specific biodynamic preparation, uh, even if we didn't understand why, really, because I don't understand a lot about biodynamic, but we used it. And today, for example, all our compost are made uh, with biodynamic preparations. And also, when we come to flower time with um, our organic vineyards, we add some tisane, some uh, special preps, uh, which have an, eff an effect on decreasing our level of copper, metallic copper used. In fact, you know, in, in, in organic, we use copper and sulfur. Uh, this is okay, but this is still copper and sulfur. And copper, as we know, is not the perfect um, metallic uh, product. So if we can decrease the amount used, uh, it's, it's, a good, it's a good way to go. And uh, we have found that using some tisane dosier, so I don't know the name in English, but uh, special preparation, we have found that we could decrease by 20, 30 percent the copper used and reach the same result versus down the medium. So it's work in progress. It's uh, trying, um, uh, trying different techniques, seeing how they move. Uh, if, if they work or not. Um, and uh, in the end, also very important, we have three uh, parcels uh, for the last 20 years that we, half is organic, half is biodynamic. One is in Chardonnay in Avis, one is in Pinot Noir in Ailly, and the other one is in Pinot Noir in Verzenay. And it's large blocks, or plots, and we, we have half of it that is biodynamically farmed and the other half that is organically farmed. And each year for the last 20 years, we've been fermenting the wines, pressing and fermenting the wines separately. We've been tasting the wines blind to see if there was an effect or not on what 
what did we prefer? Sometimes we prefer the organic, sometimes we prefer the biodynamic. And uh, we've been bottling them in single vineyard uh, bottles, a few, a few hundred bottles each time to see what it will do on the champagne after a few years in, 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 the, in the bottle. So you see, it's a very long-term process. It's not about, it's not about um, doing one thing and say it works, or it's even, it's definitely not saying, I'm a believer of this and I will do it because the church has told me to do it. Uh, no, no, we, we are uh, farmers. We try, if it works over many years, we take the technique and develop it to our own use. So we, this is what, what we have put in place is this regenerative farming uh, in all directions that, that allow us to, to be organic. And the most recent uh, move we have done, which is in, in, 19, in 2017, we achieved to do the full estate organic in a difficult year uh, with lots of botrytis in 2017. So we, were, we, we thought at this time that we were ready to enter into a certification process. And uh, by 2018, we, we entered 122 hectares, which is more than half our, um, our estate into organic certification. And we are this year in 2020, we are in third year of conversion to uh, official conversion to this um, certification. So uh, at the end of the year, we should be officially certified uh, organic agriculture biologic, which is AB uh, in France for 122 hectares, which is the vineyards of um, Cristal, all the vineyards of Cristal, all the vineyards of um, Cristal Rosé, of course, all the vineyards of Brut Nature, Rosé and White, and the Blanc de Blanc. Certified organic. Uh, that's um, one more time the decision we have taken back in '96, in the late '90s, um, not for a trend or not for um, a marketing dimension, but really because we we thought it was time to regenerate. Uh, our, our, our practice and to decrease our footprint, decreased in all directions our footprint, reduce um, the, uh, the use of carbon, of course, and this is one side of it, but this is only one side. And I'm always careful when speaking about carbon footprint because this is only one dimension. Uh, it is as important to look at soil footprint. What do I leave in the soil? Uh, herbicides or whatever. Uh, and not carbon, it's, it's pesticides. Uh, so we should look at it not only as, uh, it's always dangerous to look at one carbon footprint thing because it can lead to crazy decisions because we, maybe we will reduce the carbon and maybe we will compensate the carbon as well at one point but uh, we can do worse thing uh, on the on, 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 uh, other side. So I prefer to have a full spectrum of action to reduce our, pre our footprint uh, in the vineyards, in the cellar as well, um, to reach a point of, of um, yeah, uh, being able to, to live hand in hand with nature. That's, that's not the whole story. Uh, being able to produce a fantastic wine uh, with a very, very um, 
a little impact on nature, or at least there will always be there, there will always be one impact, of course. Uh, but uh, try to make it the most the most um, yeah the most acceptable possible. We are not perfect, I must say, and we know we are not perfect, but we try to do as much as we can. And we try to do at the right speed for the team. That, that's maybe the most important thing also is that it, it, it's, it's done on a large scale. So you need to convince your team, you need to share this vision um, with the team and that they have to be, they are part of it. Because when I do organic farming and when you need to wake up at 5 a.m. to fight, um, or to do a special thing in the vineyards, um, you can. I don't do it myself. They do it, and they, to do it, to it's not very comfortable sometimes. Uh, you know, last last Saturday, for example, all my team was on deck uh, for um, a spray before the storm, um, and they were all there. You know, everybody was there. It was. And there was, when we asked, they were all available, you know. That's less comfort, but they are part of the story. And you can achieve that if, if it's a teamwork and if you share that with, with your team and if, they, you, if it carries, if it embodies some value that everybody shares. So the biodynamic subject, I'm very careful with the biodynamic subject. Maybe you have understood it because... Um, there are beautiful things in biodynamic, but there, there are also in the very bad things. Uh, the Steiner philosophy is maybe not the most perfect philosophy. Um, so I, I think it's, it's just we, we should behave as farmers. Uh, and that's why we have chosen to go for organic and not biodynamic, even if we use, as I said, some of the biodynamic. Uh, techniques that are very interesting. Impact on quality, uh, because I said it, we are fermenting uh, wines, organic com compared to conventional, conventional compared to biodynamic, biodynamic compared to organic, and testing blind. What we, the impact we, 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 we see in this change of viticulture is uh, a clear decrease of yields. Uh, so that's the first impact. Um, the, we lose around 20% of the yields or sometimes 30% of the yields. But it's still at a reasonable level. So it's not a problem for us and for the family. So it's, uh, yeah, it's less quantity. Uh, we have a better we have a better ripeness, of course, you can imagine having less yield. We have more uh, ripeness, but at the same time, we have more freshness. And when I say more freshness, the pH are lower, but it's more, the freshness comes from more than the pH. It comes also from the phenolic ripeness that is more uh, in balance than, um, than the conventional. So we, we see uh, more freshness, more energy, we call it energy, more, um, yeah, more uh, dimensions uh, to uh, the organic wines. And uh, my team and I can, are able on the blind testing to nine times out of 10 to, to detect the organic versus um, the uh, conventional, of course. It's more difficult between organic and biodynamic. Uh, sometimes uh, we believe uh, things about biodynamic and, um, and the year after we have the, the, the opposite result. For example, in 2019, which is a beautiful year, we compared those wines and we were all convinced that one sample was a biodynamic wines because it carried all the biodynamics uh, flavors we are used to and in fact when we uncover it was the organic uh, the organic wines so and organic wines performed better 
in 2019 than the biodynamics. So it's it's a question. Uh, it's yeah, it's a question of style. It's a question of um, of what you look for. And last but not least, I think we can say that in the organic wine there is more texture, more uh, fleshiness, um, which is also one of our big target at Rodreur, because as you know, you don't, we don't do malolactic fermentation. So we do little malolactic, little malolactic fermentation. So our wines have a high acidity. So to face this high acidity, we don't have the lactic roundness that comes from malolactic. So we need the fleshiness of fruit. And the organic farming really brings that fleshiness that allows to uh, make make our um, freshness even more complex. Uh, and that's one of the secrets of Crystal, by the way, um, to have this fleshiness together with the extreme finesse. And this goes also in the good direction when we want to decrease our dosage. That's one of our stylistic decisions we have made a few years ago as well. It was to, to decrease the dosage on our wines. Uh, uh, pushed strongly by Frédéric Rousseau, um, our CEO, who doesn't like sugar. <laughs> so we, we took the decision back in, um, in 2006 with Frédéric to drive the sugar down in our wines uh, to, to make the wines more lighter, uh, purer maybe, but we needed this flesh to come back together. So the organic transition helped us to achieve this at the same moment. So the farming, the farming is important to us. Uh, we believe uh, seven, it's, it all comes down to the quality of the grapes, the terroir, uh, and all the organic farming we are doing targets this, this, uh, this, exp this uh, philosophy. It, but it also mean, it mean, it means also that we have to reinvent our winemaking, doing, doing the organic grapes. Uh, we had to go to, to, to reinvent our winemaking as well, uh, because you don't ferment the same way, uh, you don't age the same way with two kinds of fruits. Uh, so we have fine-tuned also our uh, winemaking techniques, use of sulfur that we have decreased um, a lot uh, because those wines being more concentrated don't need so much sulfur. Uh, we also change our attitude about fermentation where we, uh, we use more oxygen at, our, at fermentation than we used to do. And uh, we also uh, do a more and more uh, spontaneous uh, fermentation uh, work. Um, this is maybe the, the, uh, the logic behind organic farming is maybe to let the yeast uh, develop themselves. Uh, it doesn't mean they do what they want. It means that we are very, we, we, we need to be even more careful about what's happening. But today we have some very strong tools. Uh, uh, now so we, 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 are, we, we have the DNA analysis of all the yeast or, you know, we, on all juice, we do the DNA analysis of what's on board, what's on board, uh, bacteria, uh, uh, Brettanomyces, uh, yeast, uh, Cerevisiae. Uh, so I know exactly who is on board uh, in the juice. And when I have only good guys on board, uh, I, let it I let it go uh, just with a good check, but I let it happen. If I find some bad guys uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the juice, then I, I will probably act a little bit more and make sure they don't, they don't develop on this, uh, on this juice. So regenerative is important. Then we can talk about climate change. Perhaps that's one also 
important. Um, yes. Jean, Jean Baptiste, before you change topic, uh, we have a question uh, from one of our guys. Uh, they wanted to come back on um, uh, the topic you were talking between organic and biodynamic. Uh, and, and they want to know, um, in terms of performance of the vineyards, uh, uh, what is the difference? Uh, just to reiterate there. And also, if you change anything in the time of the harvesting. Mm. Yeah. So is that, I mean, the question is, uh, basically, do you harvest earlier at the same time or later because it's biodynamic or organic way, that vineyard? Uh, I, 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 uh, so, the difference of the vineyards, um, the main difference of the vineyard is that with, with organic, with organic you have only one tool to create, you know, let's, let's, let's come back to vineyards. Vineyard is, is about a soil that feeds vines. So all the, mat the, all the, the, the genius of this ecosystem is soil with bacteria, mushrooms at one point because of the rainfalls, we, we liberate some nutrients that mycorrhizas we eventually give to the, to the vines to create the growth of the vines and the fruit and the flavors and so on. This is, that, this is exactly that, what we are looking at, is when the soil work, can I act on the soil to make it work in one direction. If I, if, I, if I see the vines needing nitrogen, what can I do on the soil to activate the nitrogen feeding? Uh, if I see my vineyards not in balance, what can I do on the soil to, to do without adding nitrogen from outside, just by making the soil work? And that's where, uh, when you're organic, you just have the tilling or plowing that can help you to do that. You can plow and create mineralization and so on. With biodynamic, you have more. You, you can use the preparation, the 500, the 501, that will direct, give a signal to the uh, bacteria, mushrooms, that they must work now or they must mineralize, uh, feed, and, or even preparation 500. If you look at it, you, you spray, in fact, bacteria and mushrooms. That's what you're spraying. Back, that's what you're spraying. And so you're activating life. And that's what biodynamic is doing. It's activating life. Um, so as a farmer, I think you, 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 you need both. You need to understand your relationship with the, with the soil and with the vine. And I think in biodynamic, you have some tools that give you a way to connect a little bit more with the vines and the soil. Uh, so I would say uh, there is a, a, a stronger connection. Does it work 100% or just 20%? Or is it just your brain that makes you think it's possible as well you know i don't want to to fall into into the trap of believer as i said earlier so what, what i must say is that with the biodynamic tools you can really you're you're very dynamic uh, you're very active um, if you look at the great biodynamics like lalu bees in burgundy she is extremely dynamic She's extremely acting with preparation and so on on the soil. So I think biodynamic gives you some tools to play, to connect with the soil and play the game. Uh, and really it is interesting to, 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 look at, to, to look at the result because that's only the results I can speak. Uh, it's not what you believe, it's what it's what's happening. I have a trial in Aviz, which was completely um, full of uh, disease, which is uh, the fan, the yellow leaf, uh, the fan leaf disease, which is a very, very uh, difficult disease 
we work on, we have in Champagne. We cut the, block, the parcel in two, half was biodynamic and the other half was organic. I have the picture at the beginning, 15 years ago, the vineyards were already in poor shape. And if you look at, if you go into vineyards today, you will believe it's two different plots. The biodynamic looks like the vines are, have regained a normal development, while the organic have not moved too much. So I always bring people there when we speak biodynamic. I bring people there and say, look at that. Do you think it's different? So I can show you the picture of what it was before. What happened? I don't know. What explains that? I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, but what I see, but, it, but, but something's happened. Something's happened. Some people say that if you look at your soils as well on biodynamic, your soils are maybe more homogeneous. They, they, they regulate water a little bit more, a little bit more harmoniously. Uh, that's what some people say. Uh, there, is, there is a little bit less compaction because of the yeast and bacteria you add uh, into biodynamic, a little bit less compaction than in organic. For the harvest time, the other question. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm not finding any much difference uh, of harvest time. And in fact, uh, on all my trials, I try to harvest them the same day uh, because I can ferment them the same moment, the same way. And I think it's it allows me to really compare two kinds of farmings without uh, polluting the trial with a different depth of harvest or different things. So, um, but on the, uh, if you look at the analysis, maybe we, uh, the, we, we can see a lower pH and biodynamic, lower pH. Uh, yeah, there is a consistent lower pH on biodynamic uh, fruit than there is on organic fruit. Yes, I think, yeah, that's make absolutely sense. It's uh, um, very fascinating every time, you know, it's not the first time and uh, uh, I'm, I'm listening to you on this topic is super fascinating and we understand it takes ages to have a a potential answer so mm. it's uh but super cool uh, i think we, yes, we I, must be we must be very humble on that um, i think it's it's very important to look at that with a lot of scientific um approach uh, it's important to 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 look at at this with uh, with, with, with with a scientific uh, spirit, because if you look at it with just a philosophic or just a whatever spirit, it, it can be dangerous. You can lose your uh, you can lose your focus. And uh, my goal, and I have only one, is not to be biodynamic. Is not to be organic. My goal is to make crystal and my wines the best possible wines. So to, today, this is what I found. In ten years, and maybe I will find something else, another direction. Whatever it takes, if it's not with, with full, uh, if, it, if it makes sense, of course. But my goal is to make great wines. So that's my focus. And um, I can be very proud to have super organic wine, uh, grapes. But if they, if they don't produce as such a good wine, then or at least the same wine, it's a lost of time. It's a waste of time and money because it costs much more money. To, to do all what we are doing. Yeah? This is expensive farming. This is expensive uh, uh, decisions. This is a lot of risk. Uh, 2012, I lost 10 hectares. 10 hectares with zero crop of organic farming. Uh, we learned from that. We learned and we now are better at that and we, we are quite sure it won't happen again um, in the same conditions at least because we were not we, we understood we think we understood where we went wrong uh, but we you need to be 
the serious on the family business first, on the serious um, quality, seriously quality driven to accept to lose 10 hectares of Grand Cru in one vintage. I'm not sure many people will accept that. No, definitely not. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jamati. It makes, uh, yeah, I think we answered, uh, the, the, the Florencia said, uh, thank you very much for okay. picking this up. So we can uh, move on. Okay, so climate change, that's a strong issue. Um, that's a strong issue we are working on as well. Uh, this is, this is a, a parallel of all what we said because um, uh, climate change is, um, is active uh, in Champagne for a long time, uh, but in the world, huh? and we know that uh, Europe, Europe, um, the Atlantic side of Europe, and, uh, which is France, of course, is very uh, is one of the areas that is the most uh, touched by climate change, um, and uh, it's the most obvious. Um, what we see is that over the years, uh, we see that we have um, the winter are warming, definitely. We have warmer winters, which, and, and also spring, which uh, makes the, uh, the season start earlier because of the warmth and the water we have over the winter. Uh, we but break earlier, much earlier than before, um, which, is a, which is a great sign of, of climate change. It's a great sign, but it's a good sign for us as far as the yields are concerned, because we know that a warmer climate, uh, more humid um, in spring, is a sign of quantity. It, it's good for quantity. We have known that since the Middle Age. Uh, uh, when the crops are good in Europe, when uh, you have a mild uh, wet winter, because you have enough water in the soil and uh, the season, the spring can start, and then the, all the, the the crops can grow with enough water and enough warmth, and this makes quantity. So that explains maybe why we have quantity in Champagne now on a regular basis, which was not the case 50 years ago. Uh, so climate change is acting there. If quantity is made over the winter and the spring, quality is made in the summer. We know that the quality in the vineyards is made between flower and harvest. This is where the quality is made. And we know that the quality is good when it is dry in the summer because you have no rot, no, no disease, you have good ripeness and not too hot. And if you look at that, it's interesting to see that Champagne is warming up. Champagne, especially in the winter time and springtime, but in the summer time, it still, it's still quite cool were quite uh, the nights are cool uh, it's drier in summer so it's uh, I would say we have a ripening process that is early right picking because early but break but but we are ripening in good conditions uh, at least our, our conditions are on the same level summer conditions in champagne today or on the same level than the one on the magnificent decade or period, which the golden period of Champagne, which I love, which is 1945 to 1969. Uh, 45, 47, 50, 52, 55, 59, 61, 62, 64, 69, 66 as well. I'm a 66. That's why I say that. Um, those years are absolutely glorious for Champagne and 
we approximately have the same summer than at this period. After 69, we had a cool period in Champagne. So 70s were very cool uh, summers, wet and cool summers, 80s as well. And since the 90s, it's coming back, but we were really we have really changed uh, this summer profile uh, coming since two, the 2000. We are back to what we used to be in 45, 47, 52, 59, and so on. And I can see that on my analysis. You know, each year when I complete harvest, I look at my database of the, fam of the house. I compare the sugar, the acid level at Peking of Chardonnay, Pinot Noir from Berzonet, from Ai, from Addis. Mm -hmm. And I'm lucky to have all this data available in the house. And then I project the harvest compared to previous harvest figures. And for the last 15 years, see, I do it. I, I, I land always on 59, 64, 47. This is, we are in this period of time. So that's very good for quality because that made some outstanding wines. And I think Champagne has never been as good as it is today. That's, that's a clear sign of what we, we are having. So we are lucky. It, it creates something quite fantastic as well in the region because uh, growers now are making wine because it's easier to make it. You know, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, they were selling to houses because it was complex and they didn't have the skills to make single vineyards and so on. It was difficult. So now on the grower movement, you can see in Champagne is clearly due to these conditions that are beautiful. It's easy today to make a good Chardonnay, a good Pinot Noir from single vineyards. And you don't need to be super uh, skilled winemaker to do it because the grapes are healthy, are ripe. So you can do it. And this is why Champagne is so exciting at the moment. I think this is one of the most exciting places on earth in the wine, in the wine uh, world because you have this new Champagne terroir climat. We should, we should borrow the, the, uh, Ingl the Burgundy word. The climat of Champagne are now in full swing. You can really see each plot, each terroir singing its own identity, its own character. Uh, to the point we are restarting making still wine here as well. We make Coto Champenois, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, single vineyard. It's, it's, it's a fantastic moment we are living thanks to uh, this, as I said, early bird break. Uh, great summers, and we can really it it, it makes Champagne quite special. Uh, uh, champagne a special place to to live in today. We can also it explains also why we can go back to organic as well easily because we have we don't have wet and cold summers. We have dry and quite sunny summers. So. The, we can change our techniques to go to organic. We can do all, all what we have talked uh, before is, is a consequence of that as well. So it's a great, it's a great uh, moment. You have to, but we have to reinvent our winemaking, as I said. Uh, maybe we have to do less and less malolactic for people because of more ripeness. Uh, in fact, it's just coming back before 60 because be, uh, remember that before 60s, no champagne was doing malolactic because we didn't know what it was. So non-malolactic wines, uh, fresh, um, more oak because you are non-malolactic so you can reuse a bit more oak fermentation while we were shifted to, we had shifted to stainless steel, we can go, come back to more oak. Uh, so there is a full change of winemaking happening in Champagne. A change, uh, may, we, are, we are even talking different uh, density of plantation. Uh, we are talking about different canopy. I'm increasing some canopies. I'm 
I'm increasing my density of plantation. We are changing pruning slowly. So we are really, it's, it's a really dynamic moment of reinventing uh, champagne with uh, the idea of keeping the freshness and the elegance of our terroir, of course. That's what we have today. Now, where do, where, where do, will we be in 20 years time? We don't know, uh, but we are convinced that we have to, uh, of climate change and global warming. So we have to be careful not to, uh, we have, we have to, to reduce all our uh, impact uh, to this uh, global warming, even if it's very little, because we are not the, the biggest pollute, polluting businesses, but we can do whatever we, we, we try to do whatever we can to decrease uh, our footprints, to decrease our, the carbon footprint of the company. And over the last 10 years, for example, we have decreased our carbon footprint by 26 percent. Um, redesigning some package, uh, shifting to lighter bottles, um, decreasing our uh, consumption of uh, air conditioning, um, doing less and less uh, things like that. We have been able to decrease uh, Re um, looking at all our uh, byproducts. By, 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 by overlooking that, we have decreased by 26%, which is, which, is, which, is, which is a lot, but not enough. So we have also some, we still have some, uh, some way. Uh, yesterday, we, were, we decided, for example, to not start the air conditioning at all during the summer. Uh, to decrease our consumptions. Um, this is all things like that. So, you know, I think the fight against carbon concentration, this is not big decision. You know, we, 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 have, we have a say, uh, we, with my team, we say think big, but act small. This is all small actions. Small actions, day-to-day -day actions that will allow us to be in phase with this philosophy of, of participating to the protection, the, preser the preservation, the protection of nature uh, and uh, decreasing our footprint in every, in every possible way. Um, we can have big ideas. Uh, there are always great ideas of changing this or changing that, but I must much more believe in small actions um, of cultural differences are, uh, that's, I think, more, more important than, than big, strong decisions. So, uh, climate change is, if you, if you want to, to summarize, climate change is, has a real effect. Uh, don't forget on a, that we had some heat, per, heating period and some warming period and some cooling period over the years. Don't forget that the 70s, 80s, 90s that we all have in mind because we are this generation were cooling period for Champagne. And now we are in a warming period. So, uh, and it was warmer before. So this is, the climate is changing, of course. And, um, but Champagne stays Champagne and we have fantastic possibilities now. Amazing. Um, Jean-Baptiste, I've got a few questions for you that have been sent through, uh, if that's okay. So with climate change, um, you've mentioned some really positive effects which have, um, you've gone through in the vineyard. Are there any challenges that it's throwing up as well, such as the spring frosts, or are there any new diseases you're seeing which have been encouraged by the warmer weather which you hadn't had to contend yes. with before? Yes, yes, we have more spring frost because as we as we we bud break earlier, we are uh, more exposed to spring frost. So yes, we have more spring frost. Um, uh, we are see we we have we have had a, quite a few spring frost in the last years. Um, we are working on developing and we have developed for this year a new um, wood chips 
heaters that we can locate on very, very specific areas. So this is sustainable wood chips uh, origins, local origins that we use to, to fight against that, but only on one hectare or two, where it's, uh, we, we are also, we have a fan leaf, so we are, you know, we can fan to warm up the area. So yes, we are developing more and more actions against, um, against spring frost. We have new diseases as well, diseases as well. And they are coming from the south, of course, and it's normal. And that's uh, our, our main, uh, we have a Flavescence Doré, which is appearing in Champagne while it was banned from Champagne, but now we know it's coming. Um, we have Pierce's disease that is in Italy and coming up as well. It's not yet in France, but we know that it can, it can come back. And there are many new insects developing as well. Uh, our our um, policy here is what I, all what I've said is that I, I, I try to increase the biodiversity in my vineyards, Vine uh, massal selection, um, wheat, soils. Um, trees and so on to have a really dynamic and an alive ecosystem. I believe that the stronger the, 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 the stronger the ecosystem, the more difficult it is for a foreigner to come in. Uh, because it has more more uh, chance to find a, pre, a predator or to not be able to develop in the space. So so the more you will be organic the more you will be um, full of life in your soil, in your vineyards, in your, um, yeah, everywhere, the more it's going to be difficult for a new, um, a new uh, disease or a new insect, the, the more it's going to be difficult to, to settle. It's not impossible, huh? I'm not a dreamer. Huh? It, we can have a super predator coming in huh? and that's, uh, uh, we have some good examples in Australia and so on where uh, it's easy for some predators, but I think we need to we need to strengthen all life around us. And I prefer to have many enemies I know than a, a, a big a one enemy that I don't know, who I don't know. So I need I need to know my, my guys and uh, and uh, I know what to do with them. Uh, the, the new guys are always dangerous. So resilience is a key. I think resilience. The more resilient our soils, our vines, the more diverse our, our vines, the, more, the older selected our vines as well because they have seen different climate, different things, um, the more they will be uh, in, a ca in capacity to fight or to resist. Um, and with the warmer weather, has that enabled you to increase the height of your fruiting canes to help you avoid the spring frost? There, there, there is a, some people going on that, yeah. Yeah, so there, it's one part, uh, some people talk, uh, but, but the problem is that we have two, two kinds of spring frost. We have the white and the black. Um, the white spring frost, uh, yeah, that works because you're higher, you can avoid the, the cool temperature of the soil. But we also have the black frost, uh, which are wind coming from north, e north easterly winds, uh, what we call in France the Moscow Paris. So this is a, a strong influence from um, Siberia, Siberia winds, and that can be very cold. And whatever you do, high or low you are and in, two, in 2017 we had a strong black frost so and we can do nothing okay. like that so yeah it can be higher uh, canopy it can be uh, later pruning as well to delay your pruning to avoid the frost it can be uh, frost fighting with water or with uh, with uh, burners or whatever, electricity as well. Huh? There are some wires, heating wires that can work. 
Um, it depends when it happens as well, because if you have, a, if, if, if the frost happens when you are, when you have buds, just bud breaking, you are, you are very exposed. But if you have a frost happening, and when you have already some leaves developed, you can spray some sugar, some dextrose on your vines, on your leaves. And the sugar uh, osmotic pressure protects against the, the frost. Hmm. So there are many, many techniques um, to be used, but we are, this is a full uh, topic in our R&D uh, our team, uh, which is uh, to, f to, to find the best technique um, to against, against frost. Amazing, thank you. Um, two more quick questions. Um, could you spell the name of the biodynamic preparation you mentioned that uh, you spray at flowering and it reduces the copper um, by 20 yeah. percent yeah. Tisane d'osier. Osier, o, uh, it's O S I E R. So you will translate it. It's it's a plant. It's a plant that were, lives on the lakes. So it's used to water, um, and uh, it is uh, so. Its nature is um, able to fix a lot of water. So by spraying it at the moment of, uh, it can fix the water as well as the copper can fight. So you have a double effect of fixing water. Uh, some people work also with. Uh, um, uh, clay, you know, with some clay spray. You can, you can, uh, by, by, by spraying clay, so bantonite, um, it fixes the, the, the humidity immediately. You know, you, you create, you create a, um, yeah, the, the, the humidity, instead of being available for the disease, is or well, mildew in, in case, in this case, it's fixed by clay to become mud, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so there is no humidity available for the mildew. Amazing. And final question from my side. Um, with these viticultural and winemaking changes, has it had an impact on how soon you can drink the champagne or indeed its longevity? Uh, Time will tell. <laughs> will tell. I'm not sure because I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I don't know everything. No, I have the feeling. I have my. I have the feeling that uh, the long. We, we we have believed. Uh, we have been said for a long time that longevity was a question of acidity. Uh, if you wanted to have uh, a wine able to age, you needed acidity. A white wine, I mean white wine able to age you needed acidity and low ph i don't think it's exactly true because you certainly know many high acid wines oxidized as well so so i'm not sure i'm not sure acidity is but only acidity is the element of antioxidative or longevity uh, for wine I think there is a, it's a, it, it, it's a, it's a, an interesting blend of pH and acidity. Of course, it's part of the equation, but another big part is a phenolic pool, um, and you have phenolics in white wines. People believe there is no, but we have, of course, phenolics in white wines, and the riper the vine, the wines, the, the grapes, the more phenolics you get during the pressing because of course the skins are weaker and when you press, you crush of course some of the skin and you bring phenolics into the wine. I think, I think the, the best balance to fight for longevity is at the same time acidity, low pH, but phenolic structure. And these two work together for aging. And uh, we have many examples like this in Champagne. Uh, if you look at 1929 Champagnes, uh, very hot year, very warm year, 28, 29, from best vintages of the 
first part of the 1900s, 28, 29, ripe years, early harvest, hot, dry summers, ripe fruit, low acid, Fantastic wine to drink today, if you're lucky enough to have a 29. Huge freshness. Uh, 59, more recent. Super low acid. Super ripe. 12.5%, uh, 13% in Chardonnay. 12% alcohol in Pinot Noir. Um, if you test a 59 today, amazing freshness. And not oxidized. That's... For, to me, uh, more recently, 1976, 1976, everybody said, we picked on 1st of September, very ripe. Everybody said that won't age, too ripe, not acid enough. You test 76 today, amazing freshness. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure, those, uh, those examples should, yeah, should make us think about that. So I'm not I'm, I'm not scared of aging. Thank you, Jean Baptiste. There's all the questions that have been sent to me. Um, um, yeah, and no, I don't have other question either uh, on my chat. So yeah, I think it's been all question done. Uh, one more, sorry, Mark Bingley is asking about 2003 in terms of longevity. Yeah, yeah, that's. So 2003 is a comp it's, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, it's it's of course a hot summer, dry and low acid, but it's also and that's why I didn't make crystal three. Uh, the wines were very good of three, but the problem of three is that there was a strong spring frost, and all the Chardonnay were the first the first bird of Chardonnay were killed on, uh, I think it was on the 11th of, June, of April, something like that. So the second buds started and uh, it, is, it is coming from second buds. That's why I didn't make crystal. I didn't feel comfortable in making crystal from second buds um, because I, it doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to me, but I made a vintage. I made a rosé and I made a blanc de blanc on all those wines today are delicious, fresh, and they age very well. So one more time, it's not, it's, 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 it's a good example. Uh, 2019, maybe you've seen on um, Instagram during the last summer, lots of um, canicule, very hot weather, lots of, um, in Champagne, lots of damages by uh, uh, cluster being completely burnt by a very hot temperatures uh, in July and in late June and in July. But at the same time, the wines were super low pH and super fresh. So there is no link between um, a hot summer, a low acid and aging capacity. Um, one more vintage question for you, for Cristal. Um, how have the 83 and the 87 vintages held up? Oh, I should test them again. I was going to say, I'm guessing somebody's asking about their cellar here. <laughs> well, 80, 83 has aged very well. I had it recently or in the last year. 83 has always developed. It's, um, it's a concentrated year. Uh, even if the yields were quite high compared to the to the to the period, I think it's a wine with a lot of um, structure and phenolic uh, structure. So it ages well. Eighty three, eighty seven. I'm sorry, but I don't have it in mind. Uh, I cannot answer that question. But eighty yeah. three definitely. Maybe they must drink their bottle of uh, eighty seven and get back to us and let us know. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> Brilliant. That's all the questions that have come through for me. Yeah. I don't have any, I don't have any either. So um, I think, yeah, uh, if it's no more question, uh, I would say thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Jean-Baptiste uh, for this fantastic, uh, fascinating topics with touch base on Rotherham. 
uh, it's absolutely amazing, very, very, very interesting, very uh, lots to learn as well from our side. Mm. Thank you for everybody uh, mm. attending. Uh, and uh, I would say I wish everybody a nice day, nice week. Uh, still uh, keep safe, especially for, uh, for mm. UK based people. And uh, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I think just, just, just one thing uh, to finish. Uh, because we are going through difficult time. Uh, and, you know, there was lots of questions during that time of uh, COVID and so on about what we, we, we are making wine of pleasure. We are we're making a wine of celebration. And there was a lot of questions about doing our work. Well, does it mean something to do what we are doing in this difficult time? Um, I think we made a collective answer at Rodreau is that, um, with my team, we said we must even, of course, we must even uh, do a better job. Of course, we can, this is very important in those difficult times to make, what, to do what we are doing and to push, to push the limit and trying to do, to do even a better wine. And we have a beautiful 19 vintage to bottle, which is a fantastic vintage. And we have this glorious 2020 season that's been fantastic as well. So I think it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a strange feeling we had. We said, okay, we make something that is not essential to life. But yes, it is. It is essential to life and to, to people getting together. So don't worry, we'll make wine, a beautiful wine for you to enjoy when all this will be over and for many years. So we are, we are at work and we, 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 do, we, we do what has to be done. Thank so, goodness for that. <laughs> yeah. And I wish you a great de-lockdown. Yeah. Because um, it's happening in France and uh, I hope you will, you will enjoy as much as we do. And that uh, all this will be over very soon and that I will come back to the UK as soon as I can. Wonderful. We hope so too. Thank you, Jean Baptiste. Thank you very much. That Thank was you, Jean Baptiste. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.